I'm just gonna start recording there now. Right. Hello and welcome to Ireland. Oh, can't even speak. Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. We are here for the opposition preview, and I'm delighted to be joined by Republic of Ireland fan Rob Daly, who works for Spurs TV and Premier Sports, who would cover a lot of Premier League action. I'm sure other action as well across the football calendar as well. But I said to Rob to get him on, and uh, it's a good op- uh, opportunity to kind of discuss. Um, I suppose there's a lot of Premier League players and you would see a lot of the English players so we said we'd get you on. Uh, do you want to tell the audience a little bit kind of, of how your background is and why you're an Irish fan to start off? Yeah, so um, thanks for having me on first of all. So my parents are from uh, Dublin. My my dad is from um, Rohini and my mum's from Ballyfermot and I was... You know, already on the commentator scene a little bit, you know, like on the circuit. And then a few, probably about 12 years ago now, I got in touch with Satanta Sports, as it was then, and said, I've got family in Dublin. If you ever need a commentator, I can just sleep there. I sleep, you know, on my granddad's sofa in Ballyfermot, which I did for about two years every other weekend, and would come over and do commentary work for them on their Premier League show. And um, and I've sort of been, you know, that channel and that... Uh, Companies taken various different incarnations all the way through to Premier Sports as it is now. And so I work for them. I do the Premier League three o'clock on Saturdays. And um, and yeah, and I was commentating on Ireland's run. I say run, the uh, the qualifying campaign for the last European Championships um, for Viaplay, which was kind of a affiliated channel. So, um, so yeah, looking forward to chatting about the Irish national team in the context of this game as well and seeing... Um, seeing what they're going to do against an England team that, again, we don't really know what to expect from Lee Carsley. Yeah, well, I suppose that's uh, just to start off. Obviously, we know this, you know, I, this might be a first that two uh, Ireland and England managers are kind of making their international managerial debut against each other in this fixture. Um, obviously, with Heimer Hel- Halgrimson, um, Ireland, our manager in Ireland for this one, and then obviously Lee Carsley's coming in as interim manager who will... I suspect be looking to keep the job and obviously he wants to get on a, a good grounding to start off with but uh for you how do you how are you kind of looking at this from the outside looking in are you feeling like this is a good time for Ireland to catch England or do you think this is a good opportunity for England's kind of newer kind of players in this squad to kind of make a, a claim for a spot for future squads going forward well in terms of the managers I don't actually think it's an ideal game for either to be their first game. So in the case of the new Ireland manager, it's a really tough first match, you know, against a rival. And while England have got this much changed squad, there's still all that brilliance in there. And then for Lee Carsley, um, he, you know, a man who I I think most of us wanted, uh, I I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, most of us would have been thinking he would have been an excellent selection for the Ireland role. He prob- yeah, he was he was my favourite as well. Yeah, yeah it was, I think he I think he probably had in the back of his mind that this possibility might arise. I suspect that not that he knew anything about Gareth Southgate leaving, but given that Southgate went under twenty ones to seniors, that there was the possibility, especially given Lee's success at that level, that he could uh, step up to the senior role, even in as it is at the moment interim. Um, so I don't think it's ideal for either, uh, but it probably makes the match more interesting especially to see how I, I imagine the new Ireland manager is going to go about it in his football in a more pragmatic way. And then Lee Carsley has all these untested players. Um, so I think it's going to be a really difficult match to call. It's just whether the individual brilliance of England on the day just proves to be too much. Yeah, well, I think you said there about individual brilliance. Uh, Halgrimson basically said today that he'd be relied on the whole squad to kind of work as a unit. And if they're to mm. win, that they will work as a kind of progressive unit together. Um, because if you obviously look at the England squad compared to the Ireland squad, they'd have a lot more kind of individual talented players in that regard. And someone who could turn a game uh, in an instant, whereas Ireland don't really. It's, we kind of rely on a lot of set pieces, as you'd know, um, from covering the games and obviously watching them as a fan, that mm. we don't really have... Um, our speciality is probably set pieces is that we are good at defending them normally and we're good at scoring from them. That's generally how we get a lot of our goals. Um, but I think with England, you know, there's such gifted technical players that can, uh, and they've got obviously who you, someone who you'd know very well in, in Harry Kane, who looks to be back and I think he's going to captain the side as well. 
Yeah, I mean, look, there's some interesting names in the team selection because Tino Livramento has got his first call up. There's Noni Madueka, uh, there's Morgan Gibbs White, and there's Angel Gomez. And I must confess, other than seeing him as a youth player at Manchester United, I haven't actually seen much of Angel Gomez. He's something of a, a surprise call up in line for his debut. Um, but there's still really good players in there. I think Lee Carsley's gone for a blend of having to differentiate himself from Gareth Southgate and pick new players. You know, players he has connections with from the under-21s, and Gibbs White would certainly be one of those. Um, but also not to use too many players from the European Championships, because I, I think it's clear, and if you've been watching a lot of Premier League football, I certainly think some of those England players have suffered from going deep into the Championships and coming back into the Premier League just haven't looked... Bakai Sakharach, who's looked unbelievably sharp and he's in the squad, but, you know, Foden's not there, Palmer's not there, Bellingham picked up an injury pretty quickly um, with with Real Madrid. Um, but there'll be there'll be players in there like who weren't actually used much at the European Championships who might be in line for minutes. Someone like, you know, Anthony Gordon or Bira Eze, who actually did pretty well off the bench. Um, either way, I mean, we know that any of these gifted technical players would be an Ireland's team in a heartbeat. And... Um, this, you know, if he if he's going to go four three three and try and use Angel Gomez to dictate play and Declan Rice to hold and all these things, they don't really have that holding midfielder. I think this was kind of exposed at the at the finals in Germany. Um, but either way, it's going to be like a crazy strong Premier League experienced team from England. Yeah, I was. I think just kind of looking at the fullbacks uh, scenario, there's no kind of ne- recognised left back. There, um, I know you said about Livermento, and he would probably be the player who probably plays there. He seems the one that's going to be most likely. But someone like Ogbeni, I think, might get a bit of joy against him, um, just because of the way and the year kind of Ogbeni's had. And for Ireland, he does tend to kind of strike up a really good relationship with Seamus Coleman on that right hand side. Um, and I could probably see like Maguire and probably Stones, or you know, will he go with a back three? I don't think so. But you probably know more than me uh, in regards to Carsley. Um, you've probably seen a lot more under-21s of the English team than I have to kind of know what his best formation is. But based on the squad, it kind of tells me that it would probably look like a back three with maybe someone like Gwehi, Stones and Maguire. And then you've kind of got wing backs uh, like Livermento or Trent or uh, Rico Lewis. That's what I can imagine, but, I, but I'm not 100% certain. I'm not sure either. I mean, I, I, I could foresee a situation where by Livermento's at left back, and that would be an interesting head to head with Obene. I mean, I think back to the the uh, the home defeat to uh, France back in March, March yeah. and what he did to Teo Hernandez that that night like tormented him. And uh, I, I do think Obene seems to kick up. I'm really happy with his move to Ipswich Town. I think that's going to be really exciting to see what he does there. But um, I think him against a, a, a fullback. Livermento has played there for Newcastle, but a fullback who's out of position would actually be very good. I saw Livermento at the weekend because he played it right back against uh, Tottenham and was excellent. Was really, really, really good. And they ended up paying a lot of money to get him from Southampton. The other interesting thing in terms of how he views the fullbacks is he was asked about Trent Alexander Arnold, which of course has been a major talking point. The midfield experiment kind of failed in Germany in the group stage, but he says, no, no, I see Alexander Arnold is a, he's a right back. And he said right back, not right back or right wing back. So I wonder if it is going to be four at the back and trying to be expansive. I don't think he wants to look too defensively minded. I also think this game is a bit of a landmine for Lee Carsley. I mean, not only that he's a former Ireland international, but you lose this game, it's a horrific start, isn't it? It's a horrific start. And and this is even in the context of probably many English people not fully understanding the state the Irish team's been, or certainly was at the end of Stephen Kenny's reign, just how difficult things things were. And I think for Carsley as well, he's having to do something politicians do, which is convince the public that you're suitable for the role, you know, like a like a potential prime minister might have to. So Carsley's appearing at the games and looking like an England manager. I don't think he's the the uh, most convincing public speaker. And obviously he's going into one of the biggest jobs in in European football and trying to show the public. Yes, you haven't seen any of my work, probably, but I can lead to Bellingham and Harry Kane. So he's on him and the FA, if he is to get this job, is on a big kind of public relations mission. 
And so to lose this game would be bad, would be pretty bad to, I think, his prospects of of getting the job. So I don't think he'll muck about, he'll go as strong as possible and, and try and win this opening game. Yeah, that's what I said when we were doing our preview last night. Like, it's not going to be, people forget that, you know, they're thinking, oh, England, they have a bit of a, I suppose a depleted squad if you look at the Euros final. Um, some of their best attacking players are, you mentioned Bellingham, Foden, Palmer, um, who are big players for England. Um, but they still have players like Saka. They still have players like Harry Kane. Um, Trent Alexander-Arnold is one of the best players in the world as well when he plays. Um, you've got John Stones there as well. And um, even Jordan Pickford's such a, such a quality player for England as well. I'm an Everton fan, but... I think Jordan Pickford's been brilliant for England for the last uh, since Southgate came in. Really no, outstanding, outstanding. He was brilliant at the European Championships. I saw him again at Tottenham game uh, where he had a, he had an absolute nightmare against Spurs in that in that four nil. Um, but for England, he's he's been near flawless, and he is the undisputed number one at the moment. I mean, you know, for his all round game as well. I mean, Nick Pope's a really good shot stopper. So, you know, if you were to randomly pick a team from that. That England squad, you might have Pope in goal, then it might be Livermento, Stones, Maguire, Alexander Arnold, a midfield of Rice, Gallagher, and someone like Eze or Gibbs White, and then it's Kane, Gordon, and Saka. So it's really good, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah. you know, yeah, well, there's there's people forget how good uh, Anthony Gordon actually is, and I think he'll. You know, be chomping at the mip or at the bit, sorry, because of you know what happened in the Euros and the lack of game time that he really got. He, he really backs himself. I think you you probably would have saw the interview he did with Gary Neville, how he, he kind of spoke yeah. about himself and his, he's confident in his ability, and so he should be. Um, he's a really dangerous player, and he's shown it a lot of the time in the Premier League. So you're looking at him again. Grealish could come in there. There's a lot of history there with him himself and Declan Rice. Um, which we we had spoken about, and we all we all expect them to get a a bad uh, reception. I don't really care about Jack Grealish in that sense. Is I was going to say is it Decl- Declan Rice will get a a worse reception. Yeah, well, pe- people tend to kind of put them in the same bracket, but I I don't think you should. I, I actually think Jack Grealish seems to be a good sort of guy. Um, he played under uh, underage, sorry for uh for Ireland, and, and went to play for England when he knew he was going to be playing. Um, senior football for England so look I get it and, and look what he's gone on to do Rice on the other hand he played three senior international games for mm. our country he knew what he was doing and said skedaddle as soon as he could and that's just putting it lightly um, but yeah we. Like, I don't know how you feel about him I don't know if you want to talk about him but we yeah, definitely no, I mean, over I, here don't I, like him I, I, I mean uh, I was in um, I think I was in Premier Sports when uh, we had Martin O'Neill in, and uh, I don't know if you remember the exchange between him and Owen, the presenter. Oh yeah, yeah, I do yeah, yeah. About Declan Rice, uh, which was just fascinating, uh, kind of piece of discourse where Owen was saying Martin was saying he didn't want to play for Ireland. Essentially, I think wasn't it? It was essentially yeah. like he wasn't going to be an Ireland player. To which Owen was saying, "Well, why did you pick him then?" And then th- there was this back and forth that just kept going on which was brilliant brilliant tv but um yeah, look, kept saying you didn't want to coerce them yeah yeah i mean look ultimately i'm I kind of in the end i kind of fall down on the angle that seamus coleman has ahead of this game where it's you want players you want to play for ireland yeah you, know, you want players and if you you know someone i work with gary breen who grew up in uh, north london but only ever saw himself as irish and wanting to play for the irish national team it wasn't this kind of Maybe I'll do one and I'll switch. And I mean, there's also the thing with there was the thing with Tom Cannon, wasn't there? Where it was looking like um, he was. When was that? Was that, that, that last. Well, now towards the back end of the season before last, when he had the good run with Preston. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, look, ultimately, I think everything's worked out. You know, obviously, you'd want players of Declan Rice and Jack Creech's quality. They probably would be Ireland's two best players. You know, if they if they're in the squad. But you want players who want to play for your country. I think that's crucial. And um, I still think, you know, if there's an Ireland team that shows fight, and I think back to that France game in March, I thought Ireland were excellent um, and lost the game and nearly got the equaliser, but for a brilliant save that um, Nathan Collins header. Um, if Ireland are competitive, then I think they can, they can get, they can get a result. But, you know, I think we're still all a bit, Scar to be an extreme word, but from the Stephen Kenny era and just how flat everything was by the end, and whether 
whether the new manager can turn it around and turn around public mood as well. Yeah, well, I think you, you kind of said about um, Carsley earlier, about he's kind of putting himself there, out there to the public. I think Halgrimson is too, because a, a lot of the Irish fans aren't convinced. You know, when they first came in or first heard him, they were like, a dentist has taken over as the Ireland manager because they, they didn't really know what he had achieved in the game. Obviously, he's been off with uh, Jamaica uh, just recently and now, um, and before that, obviously, we know Iceland, but yeah. Other than those two jobs, like he's not really been involved with a club, so to speak. He was away um somewhere far it might have been Dubai or somewhere like that. I can't I, it came, I, came out of nowhere, didn't Qatar. it? I mean when the news broke that day, I mean I was not I was not, I was not expecting that. Yeah. But look at and this is a guy who's got a good win against England. Yeah, but they're 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 whole they're honing in on that. But I think Lars Lagerback was actually the manager, and he was just helping him. Well, that's right. Yeah. So they were kind. Of, what were they? Were they kind of co managed I didn't really understand yeah. that. They were I think it was like maybe Julia and Roy Evans back in the day for <laughs> Liverpool. Probably, yeah. Like that. That, well, that didn't work out as well as that. I don't think in the end of it. Um, no. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. What I don't, look, I don't doubt that he's going to go. You know, defensive and try and hit on counter and score from set pieces and use that threat to to uh, to hurt England but this is an England that's complete on a completely different technical level to the team of 2016 when there was you know there was major shortcomings in that in that team because even if England are faltering you know on the night they can turn to the bench and bring on Grealish or Bowen or Noni Madueke who's had a really good start to the season so um I heard really... I heard Madueke is out that's what uh, I heard. Is he? I heard yesterday he's out but I can't confirm that yet uh, I didn't probably won't know till Carsey does his press conference later on, but uh, I think he might be uh, out. Obviously, he had such a, a brilliant weekend there with Chelsea there the other week, so he'll be in red hot form if he is there. Hopefully, he's not on this occasion, um, but he does look a really exciting talent. But I, I want to just ask you about because you, you mentioned the Stephen Kenny era, um, you know, we were starved of any kind of sort of excitement in that time. Uh, look, I think Stephen mm. done his best, but ultimately it wasn't good enough in the end. And I don't think our squad really helped uh, a lot of lack of experience. And I think that kind of goes back to further past what Stephen, uh, you know, before he came into the job, is the fact uh, a lack of development of, of younger players. I think a lot more of those players now are experienced that you like to Daroche, who's just got to move to Ipswich. Um, Nathan Collins as well. You know, these players are a bit more uh, savvy, I would say, international savvy uh, players, even Jason Knight to, a, to an extent. Uh, these types of players who are coming in now, they're, they're 20, 30 caps under their belt now and they're a bit more. Do you see, do you kind of feel like there's maybe something shifting in the right direction? Um, you've got players like Adam Eda, Troy Paris, uh, who are scoring goals and scoring goals for Ireland now, which they weren't doing previously. Um, mm. They both got good moves this summer. And uh, you've obviously got Evan there, who's kind of had a, come off the back of a, I suppose, a frustrating season at Brighton with yeah. injuries and, and stuff like that. So do you see now, do you think we're kind of, turning into a, a better situation now than obviously I think, I think so I mean I've, I've heard the argument you know I, I, I my issue sometimes with Stephen Kenny was what he would say after a game did not match what you'd seen so he would talk about passing and the spells of domination and these kind of things that just I, I just couldn't see it but when he'd talk about and it you know, there would there'd be jokes made maybe about how often he'd mention how many players he's given his debut to or young players coming through. But I do think there's um, truth to the school of thought that the manager after him would benefit from this. You know, that that he would give a lot of these guys their debut and bed them in, and the next guy's got a bunch of kind of experienced internationals. But the counter to that would be, well, if they were good enough, they were probably all going to get a chance anyway. And there wasn't a uh, a plethora of players to choose from. I think he did kind of did a good job of trying to signal there was a new era, but then there'd be games where he'd bring back Shane Duffy. You know, you know, it was it was it, and and I'm not calling him out. It was more like it looked like he was moving away from that kind of thing at times, and then would revert back to type, and it was just a bit muddled by the end. I did feel for him. I think he was trying his best, um, but I'm excited by the talent. I'm also excited. I mean, you, your account's really good for, for highlighting all these guys in Europe. All these guys that are popping up at Italian clubs and Spanish clubs and even O'Brien last season at Lyon and all these things that kind of caught me off guard a little bit. I think this is what's kind of exciting, that there's kind of this uh, exciting group of players out there now across the continent who 
who could represent the country. Even Troy Parrott now getting his permanent move to RZ is is um, is really exciting because he's look. It's not the top league. It's not one of the top five leagues. But he'll be playing regular football, European football, Europa League football this season. He'll play Tottenham, his old club as well. So I think there is an exciting group there. Um, and also I'm really pleased that it looks like Sammy Smodix is actually going to kind of come to the fore a little bit as an Ireland player as well. Yeah, because we wait so long to obviously get him in and we only got yeah. a glimpse of him there in the last kind of couple of windows. Um, and he's been played out of position by John O'Shea. I hope ha- uh, ha- Heimer, ha- Heimer, Heimer I, I, think, say. Yeah. Uh, I hope he, <laughs> I nearly called him Homer. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope he can uh, find a way to put him into a central position if he's going to go with Adamida, maybe start Adamida up top with him instead of yeah. playing him off the left or the right. I'd love that. Yeah, uh, and you play Ogbené one side and whoever the other side. Uh, yeah. Robbie, it's probably going to be Robbie Brady, Calmo Dowd, uh, by yeah. the by the looks of the team. Um, I st- I still think he'll probably go with a back three, but he'd be interested to see what defenders he goes for. Will Jacob Bryan come in? Obviously impressed uh, last season with Leon. Hasn't played too much with Everton, which is quite frustrating. Um, used to me, it, it, obviously Carabao first, Cup, yeah. Oh, the Carabao Cup he played. Yeah, he got an right, assist, yeah. but uh, Dice is, is, is hell-bent on the Premier League experience, so he won't play him till he has mm-hmm. it. Although, how can he get it if he doesn't play? But uh, that's a story for a different day. You've got Omar <laughs> Bamadeli in there. You've got Nathan Collins, uh, Darrow Shea. That, I think, would be the back three because yeah. they're Premier League proven. Um and then I would imagine Seamus Coleman, the right, uh, maybe Matt Doherty, the left, I could say, because I just think if we're going to be struggling against pace with Pacquiao Sacco, Saka, sorry, uh, I think Matt Doherty could play there. Mm. And then the midfield is, is is anybody's guess. And I think with Evan, Fer- Evan Ferguson not really playing that much this season, I think Adam Eder would probably be the one who leads yeah. the line, although Troy Parrott could be because he's uh, a few games into his season, had a good pre-season, hasn't scored yet for AZ, but, um, you know, he scored, obviously, the winner against Hungary in our last home game as well, so that could potentially uh, give him some kind of mentions of start as well. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what lineup he does go with. Ogbeni wasn't in the last squad through injury, I think. Um, yeah, that's right, yeah. I, I mean, it kind of it feels nice as well. There's this other talent come through and other potential important players because it felt like the burden on Evan Ferguson at the start of Euro qualifying was pretty heavy duty. Yeah, but there was a lot of it, he's the he's the guy. He's the next, not only next great Ireland player and Ireland's best player already. He's you know he's kind of like Harry Kane in his playing style. He might be that kind of striker. He's worth eighty million. Brighton want eighty million if you want to buy him and. He's had a very tough time. I know, you know, part injuries and then selection and things that Roberto De Zerbi said and stuff like that. But it does feel nice that Ireland are not going into a game thinking, Evan Ferguson better do something. Yeah. So, I think so, it's, uh, it's nice to have, yeah. uh, you know, a... Uh, uh, and other players contributing like when Evans not play, not playing you had Ida scoring and you had uh, Troy scoring as well so I think that's that's what we need is more, is more kind of goals spread around the team because our midfield is just kind of our weak point in my opinion I think Kelleher would probably yeah. be the number one and then the midfield <clears> is just going to be a bit of a struggle but I suppose just to kind of finish off I, I always do a, a score prediction so <clears> I get your prediction if you want to see your goal scores you can but if you, if you just want to say a scoreline feel free <laughs> my head's kind of saying England England will win the game like that's just that's just quite logical but if I'm going to put something down for you I'm going to go I'm going to go 1-1 Dara O'Shea <laughs> header from a set piece and uh, Harry Kane so I'm going to go 1-1 which would be a good result That'd yeah, no, I think we take that. I think yeah. I think we'll be very nervous playing them uh, in November in in Wembley if they have all those players back, Bellingham's and so on. So if we can yeah. try and get somewhat of an upset or or a result, I mean, it would probably go down as one of our best ever results because of the way things have been so bleak lately. Uh, that we suppose need some sort of positivity. Um, but look, we should, it, we should. It would help the manager, wouldn't it? I mean, his credibility. I mean, I'm talking about Lee Carsley trying to convince the English public, that he's an England manager. So he's kind of got three months to do that. Hamar's, I suppose, trying to do something similar, isn't he? Yeah. Well, he's trying to convince the Irish public. He seems to have like a I don't care kind of attitude whenever I see him. He's quite entertaining. Have you interviewed him yet? You Not yet, no, but uh, he's, he, he seems like a good guy. Like I, I, uh, 
you know, when we interview people, we don't tend to be kind of looking for headlines. But he did. He kind of put Tony O'Donoghue in his place earlier, saying it was none of his business what the team was going to be. <laughs> I like that kind of sort of wittiness. Too, yeah. You know, you kind of yeah. need a little bit of. We've had so many managers where there's just been a, you know, it's, it's been kind of aggressive and not very nice. And then you've kind of got Stephen Kenny, who's a bit standoffish. So if you're kind of going to get, it's like, I kind of go back to when we had Mick McCarthy in charge and it was press conferences were quite funny because Mick was able mm-hmm. to kind of give give it back as well as obviously take a bit of a hit as well. So I think it's nice when you can have a manager who kind of um, is not afraid to fire back a little bit, but not like insensitively. It's It's just he just kind of says how it is and i it like just, that it seems to work if an irish manager's got a bit bit about them than it like jack yeah but know, i think that's what, it, yeah. it, it's kind of on brand it feels like that works yeah but i think i think i think it shows that they care because i think with steven he came across too nice and people were like if that's what he's like to the media what's he like to the players you know if mm. you know he just doesn't seem convincing and he's not a very good public speaker whereas i think hamer has been he's come out there and he's given good good interviews and he's been honest and i think he has a vision for how irish football should be and look, who knows, by the end of his reign, we could be better for it, we could be worse for it. We, I don't know, but I definitely think, as you said, um, and I was a long time saying that I think the next manager will really be the beneficiary of Stephen Kenny's reign, what he did with the 21s, then obviously with the, right. the senior team and stuff like that. He brought you a lot of players, and I think a lot of those players do owe a bit of a career to Stephen Kenny because when he was picking them, especially like under, under, under 21s, a lot of them were getting their... Uh, spots at clubs, I think of Dara O'Shea uh, at West Brom. Even Gavin Bazuna was getting moves, and then he got the big move to uh, from from Portsmouth, then the permanent move to Southampton and stuff like that. So a lot of players, um, I don't, well, they probably don't owe their career to Stephen Kenny, but they owe a, a big thank you to him because he put them in a window in which uh, they were able to kick on from there. And I think even in um, the the senior setup as well. I think he 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 plucked a lot of players and, and helped them in their career. I remember Nathan Collins getting plucked a few times, and then he started getting a bit of a run with uh, with Burnley then, and nearly helped them stay up that year when they got a good mm. move to Wolves. Then I think after, so there's a lot of players like that where Stephen Kenny helped them, and I think you know the more Premier League experienced players would get like that. Uh, Omar Bamadeli being another one, he'd only played I think eight games for Norwich, helped them get promoted, and he was in the squad straight away, and that was a bit of a surprise. But you look at now, he's he's looked upon as one of the most experienced in the squad because he's been in a number of squads now and he's came up against some yeah. really big hitters he played in that game against um portugal as well so yeah look i think stephen kenny's given some of them that kind of responsibility when they went in there so i think now that they're not as phased as they probably would be and i think that's gonna work well for hamer going forward now, you have players like seamus coleman Matt Doherty in there who will bring experience Matt Doherty maybe not as much but definitely Seamus Coleman I think when he speaks you listen and he's supposed to be absolutely unbelievable uh, in terms of well I know first hand from Jacob Ryan telling me about you mm. know what he's like at Everton uh, and the international setup so I mean having someone like him and the experience he has uh, is will be invaluable to some of them players especially going into this game as well well, I was about to say, actually, you've kind of got me thinking. I don't think there'll be players phased on uh, come kickoff. You know, I don't I don't think there will. It's a lot of Premier League players. I think this has kind of been an issue as well, that there haven't been players playing regularly in the Premier League. You'd probably rather have players regularly playing at the top of the championship than being unused subs in the Premier yeah. League. Yeah. But it does feel like, I mean, there's kind of this Irish contingent at Ipswich Town that I think is going to play a lot. Nathan Collins does generally play a lot. I think he had a bit of an up and down season, not only for uh, for Brentford, but for the national team as well. So, you know, I think, you know, and I think Kevin Kelleher, you can kind of, with him, I'd like to just quickly finish on him because obviously I think he's an outstanding goalkeeper. And I, I think this, this will be his final year at Liverpool, I suspect. I mean, I don't know what you think, but yeah, them signing um, Mamadashvili as their next goalkeeper, I think there's obviously an Allison succession plan in place. And maybe there's a thing saying to Kelleher, Give us one more year, be Alisson's backup, and then we'll sell you. And then when he's playing on the regular basis, that will only benefit Ireland. I don't think it helped. He he had a good run of games, I want to say, like, was it 22-23 where he played a decent amount? No. Last 20, season. 20, 20, yeah, so last season he played a decent amount. The season before that, he barely played. And the season before that, he played a lot. So, And I think when he came into the national team, who beat him with a long-range shot? Was it Latvia? What game is it? I can't remember. I but think, he yeah, looked, we beat Lafayette three two, so he the three two, two, yeah. The two, yeah, he just looked a bit rusty. So 
I think it's all about these players edging towards being Premier League regulars. And then I think there's a team that can be competitive and, and try and force their way into a major finals, which for all the talk about Ireland trying to be more passing and playing more progressive. And if you look back, actually, at the team that did qualify for 2002, they did actually play brilliant football, despite you know uh, accusations to the contrary. That It's about qualifying for major championships and giving fans that experience of going and enjoying their team and celebrating their team. So it's about qualifying. And I think the new manager, he does know how to do that. And he's done it with a much smaller nation than Ireland. Yeah, well, here's hoping. Um, well, listen, I, I, I did go for a 1-1 as well, but I did say about my oh, heart. So there brilliant. you go. But I did say, I made the mistake of saying that my heart is telling me 2-1 instead of saying my head, but it was meant to be the other way around. <laughs> and I got a bit of stick for that. But uh, no, like I, I, I could foresee England winning a 2-1, but I think we won't have a better chance to beat England than tomorrow. So we got to look at it that way. And uh, I think that's... If we can get the win, great. But I think one one I'd settle for uh, definitely before kickoff. If we were winning one nil up to the ninetieth minute and we lost, or we conceded a goal, I'd be very disappointed. So um, look, we'll we'll take the rough with the smooth, as they say, and hopefully it's a it's a good night for Irish football. Um, Rob, uh, do you want to tell people where they can follow you? Um, if they want to follow you, oh, uh, I'm on very social good on media. social media. I'm not. I'm so dull. But uh, at Rob T Daily on uh, X. And uh, at Rob T Daily underscore because I used to have the handle and then lost it for that on uh, on Instagram, and I'm not very interesting on there. But I'll generally, I will tweet things about Ireland, so um, I can't wait for the game. Yeah, well, listen, thanks very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure, and it's good to kind of get a, a mixture of both uh, teams ahead of the the big game tomorrow. You said you're not on commentary for that. You're going to get a chance to watch it. You're going to get a chance. Oh, to absolutely. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now I've got I've got a good game on Monday. I've got France Belgium, so I'm. Um, I'll start my prep for that, but definitely going to be watching. Uh, definitely going to be watching the game. Nice one, nice one. All right, well, guys, if you uh, like this video, drop a like on the video. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll have more content coming your way as we're going to be heading to Lee Carsley's press conference in a couple of hours from this as well. So uh, yeah, when this goes, by the time this goes out, the Carsley one will probably be out a couple of hours after that. So uh, we will speak to you all soon. Thanks very much for watching and take care.